that we invite you to stand and worship with us this morning.
that we have in this world we have to let go of and fix our eyes upon him he's longing for people that will go to his throne room are you willing to go there this morning
arms fling wide, I see glory as I run inside the throne room before you.
today in this place. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy and righteous. Awesome is the Lord. Visit us today by your presence in this place, Lord Jesus. Sometimes we do our feeble best to try to worship you. deserve the best, Lord Jesus. You're great and greatly to be praised. That verse reflects, or that song reflects Revelation where the the elders gather around the throne 24-7 and they cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus who is no longer the crucified one but the living one, the one who has been given a name above every name and they throw their crowns at your feet and they cry, worthy and holy is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. And we do that today. Only you, the scripture says, had the authority to do what you did, Jesus. Only you had the power and the authority to break the chains of sin and set us free. Only you had the power and authority, God, to break us loose from the stuff that binds us. Thank you for that today, Lord Jesus. Holy is your name. It's amazing to me, as holy as you are, that you welcome people like us to worship you. In fact, you want it. You love it. The Lord inhabits. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises. He lives in the praises of His people. So even when it seems like it's not much, when it comes from our hearts, you love it, God. You love it. When we, when we eke out in a difficult day, I love you, Jesus. When it's not easy, you love that, Lord. When we worship you, when we feel like giving up, you come. You come alongside us. You help us. And there are probably some that in this room need that today. We need to be in your presence. We need to know that you're real. We need to know that you are constant help to those in time of need, Lord Jesus. We lift up people that are hurting in their bodies today. Pastor Richard still needing a healing touch in his body. In the name of Jesus, we pray you'd heal his back and this vertigo and everything else that he's been dealing with. Touch Holly White today in the name of Jesus. Touch Gar Cummings, Lord God. Touch Marsha Lloyd. God, take these lesions, these tumors, these things out of her brain. In the name of Jesus, we ask, oh God, because we believe that you're able to do anything, that you're able to do above and beyond anything that we can ask or even imagine according to your power, the power that works in you, Lord Jesus. So touch Linda Sargent today. Touch Pastor Charlie right here as he stands worshiping in the presence of the Lord. Take that bacteria and junk out of his lungs and heal him in Jesus' name. Raise him up, oh God, to your glory and your honor or Steve Gaspar. God, there are many among us that need your help. There are people here that I don't even know what they're going through and they need you. They need help from on high today. Oh God, minister to them right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. We are dry and empty without you, Jesus. We long to know you and to feel your connection in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're holy. You're awesome. You're powerful. You're here. You're here with us today, Jesus. We worship you. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Just sing it real soft. Will you? Holy, holy, oh, holy Lord. God Almighty. God Almighty, glory, Lord of all, you are, you are, you are, you'll be forever the King and throne in glory splendor, holy, holy Lord, you're holy. And you're awesome. And we worship you, not just in these moments, but in moments throughout this morning. And let, the, let our lives give worship to you, we pray, Jesus. We honor you today. We magnify your name. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Great to be with you on this summer Sunday morning and to worship together in the presence of the Lord. You may be seated. 
so glad to have you with us today, and uh, I know that people greeted guests earlier today. If you are here for the first time, we're really glad to have you, and uh, just looking forward to a great, great day together. We're going to ask the ushers to come and to receive our tithes and offerings. Great to see Bev here. Bev's another one that's been struggling physically, to, and we're just really glad to, to see her here today. Over the offering, uh, I'll do a couple of things, some interviews with people, and show you some before and after pictures of what took place uh, last week when you guys transformed a couple of homes. Uh, Really honored today. I saw at least one of the families that is present with us here today, and uh, we won't point them out or anything like that because we never would want to embarrass anybody, but we're really honored to have uh, family members that uh, we ministered to and and we're a part of last week with us. And we'll show you some of those pictures and interview Fonda Holly a little bit because she went on her first missions trip with us right here in our own backyard last week. And she'll be coming and uh, let me interview her for a little bit this morning. Let's pray over the tithes and offerings. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You've been so good to us. You provide, I think of these uh, projects, I think of a couple things uh, just recently when the generosity of these people showed up all over again a couple weeks ago when we said there are kids that want to go to camp and uh, they're still short because we, we help many of them who don't have the ability to pay their way or that have multiple kids in their family. And I think it's a couple hundred bucks and we ask and I mean thousands of dollars came in. I mean, we, we were blown away by the generosity of the people. These projects, it just seemed like when we wanted to do something that mattered to you, then people's hearts and their wallets and pocketbooks came open and they said, we, we want to help. Thank you for that. Thank you for the generosity of the people. We live to give. That's one of our value statements And it's just been such an honor to be a part of that as a pastor and as a person and to give to something that lasts forever. As we give again today, we give with thanksgiving. God, we give asking you to help guide us so that every penny that comes in, we use it to the best of our ability to tell the good news and to help people that are hurting. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm going to ask Fonda to join me up here in... uh, uh, how many of you have never met sweet little Fonda Holly right here? Raise your hands before. Just raise your hand if you don't know Fonda. There's a, there's a couple of you. There's some people that need to know you still. So I'm going to hand you this mic, and I'm going to turn my other mic on. Okay. And welcome. And Fonda helps back in ECM, our early childhood ministry. She has ministry every week throughout the year. Tell us a little bit about what you do when you come in during the weeks and help Mandy. Well, I uh, apologize to the Lord for wasting my time. I'm watching too many Hallmark movies. And, <laughs> and so I came to church, church a few uh, years ago, and, and I was telling uh, Sylvia that I, I would like to help out in the office because I can good at that too so and um and glad he heard me and uh, she <laughs> said we well, can't use you there but go back and check with mandy well i have a master's in early childhood never oh. been that level before i'm in home ec for junior high and high school and college now so they found me a job so every wednesday i go to uh at 10 30 i come and i set up and and help Mandy set up the curriculum and, and restock. I can't read some of you all put those things up too high. <laughs> but but uh, so I've been doing that. And then um, in 1973, when I was de- reded- I wanted to rededicate my life to the Lord in South Charleston. I went to the pastor and I said, I'd like to rededicate my life to the Lord, but I'm afraid he's going to send me to Timbuktu, and I don't want to do missions in Timbuktu. I just want to teach home economics here in West Virginia. So he, he said, I promise you that uh, he probably won't send you to Timbuktu, but I will say this, that if he calls you, you'll want to go. Well, he didn't call me to Timbuktu. I've been teaching here 40 some years now and in West Virginia. But when I saw the missions thing, uh, the I went, Oh my goodness! At 78, I get to te- I get to come to a missions trip right here <laughs> in your own backyard. Yeah, uh, yeah, three or four miles from home, 
And I said, thank you, Lord, for, for the first time I get to do missions. And I'm so excited. And we helped prepare home economics. So I helped prepare Sonia, uh, helped her with the lunches. You did an awesome job yeah. helping out. And yeah. she was, I was so excited because she was so excited at 86, is no, that right? No, no, 78. So, okay, I, I added some. I, I flipped it. That, that's uh, all right. At 78, yeah. uh, thanks for correcting me. Well, but uh, uh, someone asked me the other day how old I was, and I said, I'm 68. And I went, oh my gosh, no, I'm 78. <laughs> I had... At 78, you got to go on your first, first mission trip. trip. Right here, and she was uh, so excited, oh, and that I got me am. excited because she couldn't <laughs> wait to help out in the kitchen. And even when it was yeah. over, she was still just flying uh, high. Yeah. And how still Jesus! Am. So you want to look at the pictures on the screen and see with oh, me uh, what oh, was accomplished? It's oh. amazing. Would you guys put those pictures up here, and we'll show you. This is the Colt home, and uh, this is where it started. And we were adding that 12 by 16 addition so that they could adopt a fourth son. And by day one, it almost looked like that. And by this is going on like day three. Uh, by I, we had added a deck rail, power washed everything, uh, got rid of an underground spring, rerouted it, and the siding started going up. And look at that. That is the before. Hold it right there a second. <laughs> that was the before and the after of the cult home. And so amazing, amazing job. There's some other incredible stories. Ryan watching, who is our project leader, his company is uh, uh, doing the electric work for free there. Uh, Mike is uh, uh, a drywaller, the guy that's the homeowner. He's a drywaller, so he's going to be putting in the drywall. And they had 50 bucks. This are so many cool stories. I don't have time to tell you all of them, but this is an example of how God does amazing things. They, we finished the room, 12 by 16. They're so excited to move in there because they've not had their own room private for years. And, uh, but it's not done. The electric had to be done, so Ryan's company's taking care of that. The drywall, they had $50, they said, to put up $50 worth of drywall. And uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, we handed them a, a Friday, we handed them a gift card to, to Lowe's, not knowing this. For $200, and they had figured ahead of time they needed $250 to do, buy all the drywall. And uh, that's just one of many cool examples of how God just over and over again provided. And the next one is the Great House uh, family uh, out in uh, Farmington. This is their, their trailer house. And our team came in, put on new skirting, painted the bottom layer right above that and the top layer above, all new windows, new front door. Marty and Val Leischer built the front porch, uh, all new black shutters on there. And look at that. Didn't that turn? Look at that. So amazing. I'm going to walk you back down. Give it up for Fonda Hawley. She's an awesome lady. She's a missionary right there. And uh, as Mike uh, brings out the, the pulpit, I want to do one more thing. Uh, there's going to be a transition of leadership uh, that's taking place officially this morning. So I'm going to ask for uh, Joni Bikanovich to join me and Jody McCroskey as well to join me up front. And uh, Jody, who is coming on my left, and you're right if you're sitting out there, she has served for the last two years. Has it been about that? Uh, jo Joni, has it been about that? Uh, two, one and a half, two years. She served as our first missions coordinator. Uh, and so she has done an outstanding job and really taken the missions program forward in, a, in an outstanding way. And uh, she has, her job has gotten ramped up and uh, a lot more going on. Uh, so she came to me a few months ago and, and starting to talk about transitioning. Uh, which I wasn't thrilled with, but she's, uh, she's put it in great shape. And Joni loves mission, and she goes on missions trips all the time. She's been a champion for missions for years around here. So today, we here, hand the baton off to uh, officially to uh, Joni. Uh, Jody hands to Joni the baton, and she becomes the official missions coordinator as of today. And we want to pray over and thank the Lord for both of these ladies today. Amen? Awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You want to say anything today real quick? Just no, just everybody's beautiful. Thank you. And God answers prayers. And 
I'm really excited about Joni bringing the missions even farther than what we already have so far. So yeah, thank you God. for doing a great job. Thank you for doing a great. She's going to still be involved, particularly with the missions conference uh, every year. She brings a lot to the table there and has a lot of contacts. And I, 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 you guys' names are so close <laughs> that I keep trying to. Joni, anything you want to say? I just want to say, if you have not done any missions trips at all. You've got to do the community projects here. I think of the, all the trips I've been on that week has changed my life more than anything. So you don't have to go far. Just be available. That's it. Let's pray over both of these ladies today. Uh, would you just reach out for them? Turn around the other way. You're, chin, you're facing me. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for these awesome ladies of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for their effort for your kingdom's sake. Thank you, God, for what's been accomplished under Jody's leadership. Lord, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we've had one of the best uh, missions giving years, probably maybe the best giving uh, in the history of the church uh, last year. And we're on pace to beat that this year. And so we're grateful for all 70 or 80 people that were a part of our uh, community project this year. We give you glory and praise, and we pray that you would help us to change lives at home. It's just like the Bible says, uh, in, our, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, in Fairmont, in Marion County, in West Virginia, in the United States, and to the four corners of the globe. Help us to see people's lives changed and help them to come to know Jesus through our efforts. And so I bless you, and we bless you for these ladies today. And we pray, oh God, and thank you for the smooth transition. And we pray, oh God, that Joni, who has such a heart for missions and has carried that torch and that banner for years when there was not even a position like this. And we pray in the name of Jesus that your anointing and power would come upon her and that she would do this with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength for the Lord and that you would use her and raise up that team on around her to make a great difference. In your name, amen, amen. Would you give the Lord praise and thank these ladies today? Praise the Lord. Well, that's a great transition. I feel really, really good about it. And uh, I also feel really good about preaching today because uh, that song I learned last night and I've been nervous all morning. <laughs> so it's like, it's like it feels good to do something that I do, you know, that I was prepared for. And so excited about it. It's the last message in our resurrection series today. And we are looking forward to to it. I love this series. I hope it someday becomes a book uh, because I wanted to trace the power of God who could create the first man out of the dirt uh, and breathe life into his lungs and, and follow the passage of sin when God said, uh, because of your sin, there's going to be a curse. And the last line, he said, you're going to die. There's going to be death that comes in ashes to ashes, dust to dust. As you came out of the dust of the earth, so you will return to the dust of the earth. And I wanted to track that all the way through the Bible till the point where the Bible says that one day the, that God, the Son of God, will give a shout. And when he shouts, he will reanimate all the dead who will be raised once again, to stand before him. And so it's been exciting for me. It's been a lot of work, but I've enjoyed this series myself, and I hope that you have, as we've uh, talked about a lot of different things. You know, God who has the power to raise the dead. Chapter 3 was all about uh, all the instances, the list of people that God raised from the dead throughout the Bible, and then the death of the life giver. What in the world was the Son of God, the one who breathed life into the first man? How is it that he could die? And then on Easter Sunday, how he was resurrected with glory and honor. And uh, then just recently, last week, talking about our, our eternal destinations. You will have a comeback someday. Jesus assured it. I think I use that verse again in this message today, that you will have a comeback one way or the other, that you will be raised to live forever in eternity in one of two places, according to Jesus. And that's who we looked at last week. We didn't even look at everything about We just looked right at Jesus because according to uh, recent polls, even though about one-third of Americans only believe that the Bible is literally true, uh, well over 60%, 62% believe that Jesus was real. And so we looked at that subject through the lens of Jesus. What did he have to say 
about heaven and hell. And we wrap it up with this message I've entitled, Living Like You're Dying. Living Like You're Dying. And the premise or the thought is this. If God can raise a man from the dead, can't he do something for us while we're still alive? And I believe the answer is a resounding Yes, and let's start it together looking at what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verse 1. As for you, Paul writes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Let's talk, I mean, there's an outline in your bulletin today or on you version with fill in the blanks, and I encourage you to follow along. We thank you if you're watching at home today. In 1978, the movie The Dawn of the Dead, written by George Romero, was, re- was released in theaters. And in this film, a plague of unknown origin hit the United States of America, causing the reanimation of the dead, creating an army of human zombies who had no other desire but to feast on human flesh. Several of the survivors in the movie, which I've never actually watched, but I've just, I have Google and uh, the internet, but uh, several survivors of that outbreak barricade themselves inside a suburban shopping mall in an attempt to hold off the zombies and stop the chaos as it spreads throughout the country. Interesting footnote, uh, they filmed it in a mall in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, that movie. And so that was a little interesting tidbit for something that's fairly close by. When I think of that movie, and you've probably all seen either a commercial or a movie or something that features these zombies, these reanimated, walking, living dead. When I think of Paul's description here, I can't help but think of zombies. You, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And here's a frightening spiritual reality. A sinner is a dead man walking, doomed to roam the earth under a curse that ultimately, if not broken, leads to hell. And Genesis chapter 3, very back at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 3, verses 17 to 19, tells the origin of the original or the deadly outbreak. The first man and woman sinned, and they released a worldwide plague that infected every human being. God's original plan for you was that you would live in harmony and close relationship with Him in a perfect environment that you would know and walk with Him every day. Instead, we are dead men walking, roaming the earth with a limited time frame, and death is inevitable and it's unavoidable and because sin leads not just to physical death but to spiritual death as well you can often i believe see the effects of the curse taking place in a person long before they're dead i've seen sin turn men and women who were once full of life into something like a living zombie. I mean, you look at them, and maybe you've done this before. You look at somebody that you once knew back when they were a teenager, a young man or a young woman, and you see them in their 20s or their 30s, and you see them out somewhere at the mall or at the at the Dairy Cream Corner or somewhere, and you look at them, and they introduce themselves, and you're like, what happened? What happened? She was so beautiful. He was so talented. They had so much potential. And now that you look at them and they stare back at you with these hollow eyes and sunken cheeks and blank expressions, sometimes almost unrecognizable shells of their former selves. And the light has gone out. And darkness has invaded their souls. And it's the curse of the living dead. They're dying even while their hearts are still beating. But as we've learned, Jesus raises the dead. He talked to a dead girl and a dead teenage boy, said to them, little girl, I say to you, get up. Young man, he's in, a, he's in the casket on the way to the graveyard. An awesome story that we did back in week three. Young man, I say to you, get up. And they got up. God, Jesus speaks to dead people. He talked to his dead friend, Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth, he said. And out comes Lazarus walking out of the grave. Okay, maybe he shuffled because he's still all wrapped up like a, a mummy, right? And he shuffled out of the grave. So Jesus called himself the resurrection and the life. Jesus also promised that the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the sound of the voice of the Son of God and they will rise again. 
And you might be thinking, if Jesus has the power to resurrect the dead, is there anything that he can do for the living? Because I know one of those zombie-like dead men walking. You described my sister. You described my brother who's an alcoholic or an addict. You described my mom or my dad. You described my friend or my co-worker. Someone listening on, on, at home today might even say, you're describing me. I feel dead inside. Some days I don't even want to live. The darkness seems like it's all around me and it's closing in and it's suffocating me. Can Jesus do anything for me right now? I feel like I'm dying even though I'm still alive. And the answer is yes, 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 he can. Let's talk about spiritual defib. As for you, let's finish the verse. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, Paul writes, but you got to finish the verse. But God, but God, but God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. A defibrillator is an electronic device that administers an electric shock of preset voltage to the heart through the chest wall in an attempt to restore the normal rhythm of the heart during ventricular fibrillation. I hope I never need one. But if I do, I hope one's close by. Because those electrically charged paddles can jump start your heart and get it beating again. What a defibrillator can do for you Physically, Jesus Christ can do for you. Spiritually, Jesus Christ can jumpstart your dead end life. He can administer spiritual CPR to you. I've seen him do it. If I, if I didn't know what I was talking about, I wouldn't preach this message. I've seen him do it again and again. I've seen Jesus Christ resuscitate dead marriages, dead end relationships. I've seen him resuscitate dead reputations and dead end lives. I've seen him restore addicts and alcoholics and inmates and people who cut themselves and perverts and abusers. I've seen Jesus give people a fresh sheet of paper and a brand new start because Jesus is a supernatural spiritual paramedic. David experienced it. He said in Psalm 7, 71, 20, you restore me to life again. You bring me back from the depths. The Apostle Paul, he talked about it all the time. It was like his theme. Anyone who belongs to Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new person. And the old has passed away. And behold, everything becomes new. And Paul knew what he was talking about because he was a recipient of a fresh start. He was an absolute enemy of the cross and of Jesus and would chase Christians around and capture them and throw them in jail, many of them to be killed. And so when he said, if anybody be any man being Christ he's new he knew what he was talking about so he loved to tell people the story of Jesus and what he could do in Romans 6 he said just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the God the Father we too may live a new life we have been brought from death to life Romans 6 in him we live and move and have our being he wrote in Acts 17 it's no longer I that lives but Christ that lives in me, he, he, he said, this is the, the life that I live now. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus said it like this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you could have life and have it to the full. For all the dead men and women walking, the same Jesus that can raise you from the dead can jumpstart your dead end life. And I'm going to tell you how he does it. Much like a defibrillator has two paddles that jolt a person's heart back into rhythm, Jesus brings people who are dead in their sins back to life through two primary power sources. And here's the first, the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit can bring you back to life again. I was surprised at how much about this in the Bible and to read about it. When a person humbles themselves and they ask Jesus Christ to forgive their sins, something supernatural happens in that moment. I've been there to see it many times. Sometimes people just kind of walk away kind of matter-of-factly like, you know, 
I know I'm forgiven. And some people, I mean, it's like a jolt. And and it's like they get up from that place and you can see the change resonating on them and in them. And the Spirit of God, when you pray that prayer and ask Jesus to forgive you, the Spirit of the living God moves inside you and starts living inside that person. And that may sound crazy to you. But remember, God is not natural. He's supernatural. He's without limitations. And if God could breathe the first man to life after making him out of the dirt of the ground, then why could he not put his spirit inside of a man or a woman? And the answer is, he can. All you have to do is ask. And it's that simple. It's it's this, God, forgive me of my sin. And come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. And a simple prayer like that releases a supernatural jolt of spiritual power that brings dead men walking back to life again. Most of us have seen, or either in TV, on a commercial, or in a movie somewhere, most of us have seen someone or uh, who was unconscious and not breathing in, in AFib, and their heart is not beating. We've seen that. Some of you, maybe I'm looking out at, at some people that are medical people that have maybe seen it firsthand. And you know what happens. The doctor or the paramedic, they, they do what? They shout, clear, right? And they hold those paddles up. They've rubbed them together, and they're firing up, and it's like clear. And they, they place those paddles on the patient's chest and boom, like a jolt of electricity surges through them and that person's body convulses. And what happens? Everybody's looking at the monitor if they're hooked up to a monitor. They're looking to see if that heart goes beep. That blip comes on there. And if there's no monitor hooked to them, they're, they're watching for a breath or some heartbeat or a sign of life to come back that lets us know that they're alive again. Often when their heart starts beating, the patient will gasp for air and their eyes will pop open and in response to that jolt of electricity and their heart starting up again and everyone is relieved because somebody who was almost dead is alive again and it's like amazing now try to imagine that scenario spiritually visualize somebody that like we just described earlier who is dead in their sins living that zombie like existence maybe they're a, a drug addict or an alcoholic and they've They've, they've drifted far from the person that God intended for them to be. And, and the Bible says that man, sin is like chains. It puts people in chains and it takes them places they didn't plan on going. And they're alive, but they're not really living. Sin is controlling them. You're worried about them. You're praying for them. You're begging them. Some of you have loved ones that you have literally nearly begged. Oh, would you please turn your life around? Would you reach out to Jesus? Would you reach out for help? I'm scared to death about the di- the. the the the, uh, direction that your life is going right here and you look at them and they're under it's like they're in a funk and they're controlled and they're dead man walking if something or someone doesn't intervene I mean you're concerned for the worse they're headed on a a one-way collision course with disaster and the difference in this scenario the spiritual scenario and the physical one I described is that the patient in the spiritual scenario is conscious And they have to ask for or request the procedure, right? And many don't. Many don't. They're living in that zombie-like, dead men walking kind of a stage. And people are reaching. Grandma's saying, would you please come to church with me? Would you please reach out for Jesus? Would you please let somebody, would you go to a counselor? Would you see somebody? And they're, they're awake and they're alert. And they look back through those hollow eyes. And they say something like this, I'll be fine, Grandma. I'll be fine. Leave me alone. I don't need any help. I can handle it. Famous last words. I can handle it. See, Shelly out here, one of our counselors, I'm sure she hears stuff like this all the time. I can do it. I can handle it. I can pull myself out of this. And they stumble on and they stumble deeper into sin. But occasionally, occasionally, this is where it gets exciting. Occasionally, one of these dead men walking will say, God, my life is an absolute mess. I'm so miserable. I'm so unfulfilled. Oh, God, I'm so empty inside. I can barely breathe. It's not getting any better. Please help me, God. Forgive me. Please help me. I don't know if I can make it another day. Jesus, I need you. Right there, it happens. 
That instant, God's spirit is released into their heart, giving them a supernatural jolt of energy, and hope floods back into their darkened soul, and their spiritual eyes open. And like somebody waking from a bad dream, you'll sometimes hear them gasp out, I'm forgiven. (laughs) I'm forgiven. I feel different. I feel alive again. It's an awesome thing to see. And they are. Paul says the spirit brings life. He says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, He will give life to the mor- your mortal bodies by this same Spirit that lives in you. They're no longer dead men walking. Jarrett Stevens in his book, Four Small Words, here's a quote. The same power and presence of God that dwelt in Christ Jesus and raised him from the dead now lives and moves and breathes in you, resurrecting your life and transforming it from the inside out. And that's how you can start living while you're dying. That's where it begins. That's why Paul Paul wrote, it's no longer I that lives. I mean, that old guy, that guy that used to throw people in jail and hunt them down and was so mean and miserable and so full of religiosity, that guy's dead. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. That's why he wrote it. It's your choice. You try to bring yourself out of spiritual AFib or you let God have the paddles. The Spirit gives life. Human strength can do nothing, Jesus said. The second power source that Jesus uses to bring people who are dead in their sins back to life is the power of God's words. So the initial jolt happens when you say a simple prayer. And kajunk, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you. And you take a deep breath and you go, I'm not lost anymore i have hope i feel forgiven i feel different i've heard people say it all kinds of ways i feel lighter i feel i feel so happy i feel like joy i haven't felt in a long time that's because the holy spirit moved inside of you gave you a jolt awakened something in you that had been long dead and the second thing you need after that is you need the power of God's words spoken into your life over and over and over and over again. God's Spirit gives you that initial joint jolt, but, but what God has to say about you, listen to this, this is so important today. What God has to say about you and to you is the second wave of healing for former dead men walking. You can can have that experience where you raise your hand and you get that, the Spirit moves inside of you. And if you're living in some environment where people are just talking smack and talking down to you and telling you you're a loser and all that, and believe me, the enemy will pile, pile on. He's always whispering in your ear, that kind of stuff. You need to get some place and some people around you that are going to speak God's words into your life because God's words are powerful and they can literally begin to bring somebody who was dead back to life again. God created the universe. How? Let there be. Right? (coughs) Powerful God's words are. He stepped out on nothing and he said, I want a universe. Let there be. And there was. Light, there was planets, there was uh, uh, earth, there was animals, there was, I mean, everything, be it, started through just God speaking it into existence. Jesus, we already talked about it, he talked to dead people. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Jesus talked to people that were dead, and they got, his words are life-giving. God's words, they create universes, they raise people from the dead. In John 6, 63, Jesus said to a group of people who were following him one day, he said these were, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. I have life-giving words to say to you. Words can kill or bring life. In fact, the scripture, the Proverbs says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I mean, somebody's words can just butcher you, fillet you, mess you all up. Many people are the product of the words that they have heard and believed about themselves. Don't miss this today. You can can find Jesus 
But if you don't get some people around you who start speaking his words into your life, you will still be stuck back. You got, you got the Spirit of God living inside of you, but you need God's words to rebuild who you are, to reframe who you are. Again, many people are the product of things they've heard all of their lives said about them. Most of them aren't even true, but if you hear them long enough and you uh, hear them often enough, guess what? You begin to think they're true. And they kill you from the inside out. Negative, hateful, harmful, hurtful words knock the life out of you. And as Proverbs says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You think something long enough, it becomes real to you. But God's words have the power to bring you back to life again. Psalm 119 is full. That's just one chapter. And it's like probably the longest chapter in the Bible. I didn't look it up, but it's long. It's full of references to the power of hearing God's life giving words. Now just listen to a couple of them. Listen to them and let them challenge you today. When I am hurting, Psalm 1950, when I am hurting, I find comfort in your promise that leads to life. Here's some other translations in the way it says it. This is my comfort in my misery, or when I suffer, this comforts me. Your promise, your promise gave me a new life. Look at verse 25. I lie here like a dying man. Say the word and I will live again. Living Bible says I'm completely discouraged. I lie in the dust. Revive me by your word. How many of you have been discouraged before and found the word of God was able to pump new life like into you? Like nothing else. Here's another one, verse 93. I'll never forget the advice or the commands or the teachings you gave me. You saved my life with those wise words. Romans 4, 17, Paul says, God makes the dead live again. He speaks and something is made out of nothing. Listen to some other translations. With a word, God, you make something out of nothing. God calls into existence things that don't even exist. You can... You can think that you are something and God can call something better up and out of you through the power of His Word spoken into your life. Such is the power of His Word. If you are a dead man walking, God's words spoken over you can bring you back to life again. But listen to me. You need to hear them. You need to get around some people who will speak them to you. You need to read them in His Word. You need to listen to them in your headphones and in the songs and the music that you sing. You need to, to hear them again and again and again until you begin to come alive because you believe those words more than the words that were spoken over over you there's a couple of songs that are like really popular right now <clears throat> and I believe the reason that they are resonating so deeply with so many people is that we all desperately need to hear what God has to say about us our worship team often leads this one and I love it and I love it even more as I think of it in conjunction or in relation to this, this subject of the words that are spoken, spoken over you. And listen to the bridge of who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. It repeats it. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am, who the Son sets free. He is free indeed. Listen to this one. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am who you say. I, I'm not who my dad said I was. I am who you say. I'm not who that coach, that teacher told me I was a loser. I would never amount to anything. I'm a child of the King. I am who God says I am. I have value. I have worth. I am loved. I am wanted. I am respected. God wants me forever and all time and eternity. Here's another one. This one's awesome. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the song of every high and every low? Remind me once again of who I am. 
because I need to know. And listen to the chorus. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I am yours. And I believe. (laughs) Oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. I believe what Jesus says about me. On my worst day, when I feel like junk, I still believe in what Jesus says about me. You can too, and it will bring you back to life again. Who in your life is speaking the words of God over you? You can read them for yourselves. And I suggest a combination of it coming from several different angles. The music you listen to. The words that you read. The people that you hang with that whisper in your ear. I I love you. I believe in you. Oh, I still say this to my kids. I'm proud of you. You don't have to do a thing. I'm proud of you because you're mine. He used to say to my daughter when I tucked her into bed at night, Daddy will always love you. Because I wanted her to know if she got older and God forbid she walked away from God, I would still love her. That's the way God feels about you. You may feel like you blew it, but Daddy will always love you. He values you. He wants you. He can rebuild your life. You just need to get around him and hear him speak into your head and your heart again. Last thought, living while you're dying. I once heard somebody say, you're not really ready to live until you're ready to die. You're not really ready to live until you know you've settled peace and you're ready to die. Truth is that this life is 100% fatal. We all have an appointment. With death. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. All we are is dust in the wind. Right? But the same God who made you out of the dust of the earth is one day going to shout, and the dead in Christ will rise to meet him. Are you ready? Because you are going to make a comeback. Jesus said so. John 5, the time is coming. When all of the dead in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they will rise again. And those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. The words of Jesus, the kind of comeback that you make someday, will be determined by whether you have accepted or rejected Jesus, the comeback king, three days In the tomb, the stone was rolled away by the comeback king. He's coming back. Scripture says, for those who are watching and waiting for him. When he shouts, listen, when he shouts, those who know him will hear his voice and they will rise. Are you ready for the return of the king? Are you living or are you just existing? Are you a dead man walking? Or have you requested the Spirit of God to apply the paddles to your heart and to jolt you out of spiritual AFib so you can come alive again with Christ? There's one more song before we pray together and wrap this this message up today. There's one more message that like fit this message perfectly. It's by Big Daddy Weave. And uh, it's just called Alive. I was dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through the fire, I was living on the run. With my flesh lost in desire, I was drowning in the flood. But God is rich in mercy, you came to save me. Now I'm alive, but God Strong and mighty reached down for me so I could rise and now I'm alive. I'm alive. What awesome.
Paul some lyrics, right? Listen to another verse. I am far from perfect. I lowered it a little bit because that was kind of high. <laughs> there are days that I regret. On this battlefield I struggle with the lies that I have lived. I have fallen short of glory. I can't make it on my own. If you kept record of my past, I'd be sinking like a stone. But God is rich in mercy came to save me. Now I'm alive. Now listen to the bridge. Now I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. I was in the grave, but God, you called me out. Now I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. I was in the grave, but God, you called me out. How many God has called out of the grave into life in this place today, huh? We're alive. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. If any man be in Christ, he's a new person and the old stuff passes away. And behold, kachunk, all things become new. And we're breathing in and we're breathing out. And I'm alive. Because of Jesus. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You're watching at home. You're in this place today. Listen, you may feel like a zombie, a dead man walking, but Jesus is a resurrector. He is a spiritual defibrillator. He is a, a, para, a supernatural spiritual paramedic. He can, he can get a hold of you, and he can jolt your dead end life back to life again. He can get your heart beating again. You can breathe in. I'm alive. I'm alive, Paul. Paul knew what he was saying because he knew what it was to be. You asked for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Christ makes us alive. Christ brought me back. That old spiritual, arrogant, pride-filled Pharisee. Jesus brought me back to life again. Now everywhere I go, even if they put me in chains and beat me, I will proclaim to everybody here, in Him we live and move and have our being. Jesus can bring you back to life. Again, I was dead and going down, but it's no longer Paul, Saul that lives. It's Paul, Christ lives in me. I'm alive again. He can do it. He can do it. He can do it. And we close the doors of this and every other church because it's just a farce and a ruse. But Jesus Christ is a supernatural spiritual paramedic. He can put his spirit in you today and bring you back to life again. And you can get some people from this church, please do it, who will come alongside of you. And they'll say the words that God longs for you to hear. You're loved. You are chosen. You are wanted. You are valuable. You are a child of the King. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There's a place in God's house. He's prepared a place for you. You're a child of the King. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and you say, you know, that's me. You might be watching at home today. You might be watching at home and tears are running down your face because you feel so broken and so empty. And you remember a time in your life when you were full of optimism and you thought that, that the world was going to be an amazing place. But something happened. Somebody whispered in your ear one day, said, hey, babe, I love you. And it was a lie. And they took advantage of you. Something awful happened. Took your life down another path. Some of, you, some of you are watching at home maybe today. And you remember sometime. Come on, just take a little hit of this. It'll be fun, man. And that opened a door to addiction. And now you're a zombie in a dead-end existence. And you can't stop. And you walk around like, oh, I've got to have another hit. I can't live. I've got I, I to have another hit. You've done things you never dreamed you'd do. Because sin will take you captive. But Jesus has come to give you life. And it starts with a prayer that a child can pray. And you bow your head. Maybe right there at home or in this room today. You lift up your hands a little bit and you look towards heaven. Because nobody's looking. This is your moment. Nobody looking around. It's a private moment. And you say, God, rescue me. Rescue me, God. Save me 
Heal me, restore me, bring me back to life again. Forgive me of my sins. I need you. I need you. I need you. And in that moment, something supernatural will take place. God comes running. Boom. His spirit takes residence in your life. And you've got a fresh start. You've got a fresh start. You can breathe in and breathe out. And you can know that you are forgiven. Don't you listen to the enemy. You go, ah, that's a joke. That can't happen. That's a lie from the pit of hell who wants to keep you a zombie. Jesus can do it. Just give him a chance. Quit making excuses. Quit dancing around the lines and give God your life. You don't know how many chances you'll get. You sit in this room today and you're hearing this message or you're watching at home saying, man, I am in on that prayer. I need God. I want to come alive. I want to know that I'm right with God. I want His Spirit to come and live inside of me and give me a jolt of energy. If you want to pray this prayer, one like I've just said a couple times. You want to pray that prayer at home, you can say it right there. But if you're in this room and you want to pray it, I want you to lift your hand right now, right now. Anybody, I'm looking right to left. I'm not going to let, waste a lot of time here. Raise it up right now. God, bring me back to life again this morning, right now. Anybody? Save me, God. Rescue. God bless you. Hey, all it t- sometimes it takes, I got one hand. Sometimes uh, one hand represented a bunch of more that should have been lifted. You can feel the Spirit of God tugging on your heart right now. You know that this is critical and it's your moment. Listen, uh, how long are you going to walk? Oh, I can handle it. I'm okay. I don't need any help. Baloney. Baloney. We all need help. We all need help. I'm going to ask again, if you haven't raised your hand and you know you should, on the count of three, I want you to raise it up real high. Raise it up. Look me right in the eye and you raise your hand and say, I am in. I'm going to get my life back starting right now today. One, every Christian in this room praying right now because that's what we do. We don't point fingers. We pray. We pray. One, two, three. Three, raise it up. Anybody else? God bless you. Right beside another one over here in the same section. Three, four, five. Raise it up right now. God, give me my life back. Give me my life back. Awesome. Awesome. It takes guts. It takes courage to do that. There's been at least half a dozen hands. There may have been more that I didn't see here right now. Come on, let's seal the deal right now. I want you to get some grit about it right now because this is your life and there's an enemy that lives to steal kill and destroy and today you put your foot through your prayer on his neck and you say enough there's a new lord of my life that's what you're going to do through this prayer I want everybody in the room to pray it out loud with me because you believe it in your heart. You've prayed a prayer like this before in your life. Maybe you need to reaffirm it. Maybe you are a Christian and you feel beat up today. Come on, take authority in the name of Jesus and step on the neck of the enemy all over again and claim who you are as a child of the King. Everybody in this room, especially those that raised your hand, Come on, let's pray together right now out loud. Pray boldly, pray with authority. Let's pray. Jesus, I believe in you. Bring me back to life. Save me. Heal me. Forgive me. Speak your words of life over me and bring me to life. In this moment, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, come on, let's add a couple extras. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Listen, 
If you prayed that prayer, man, we party, we rejoice. Heaven is partying right now with you. You've got the spirit of the lip. Don't you doubt it. You may walk out and, you know, the enemy, he'll be right there before you hit the parking lot. And he'll be, ah, oh, you're the same old person, baloney, baloney. <laughs> Jesus lives in you now. The spirit of the living God moved inside of you. Listen, you just need to let him clean house a little bit. The more he cleans house, the more he moves throughout you, the more you'll begin to feel him moving in you. And, and listen, you need to get some of those people that will speak God's words into your life. I'll tell you a couple places to get them Wednesday night. The ladies are meeting back there. had over 100 ladies on Wednesday night starting to aspire uh, the adored theme back there. Guys, we're going to start. What an appropriate subject. We start fight. Craig Groeschel's fight this Wednesday back in EK. If you don't have a guy or a lady that speaks those words into your life, come on, we'll put a table full of them around you and they can say every week words of God that will change who you are. You've got to, you've got to, got to, got to, got to, isn't that the donkey from Shrek? you got to, got to, got to get some people that will speak life-giving words into your ears and into your spirit because the enemy will keep saying cruddy stuff to you. Reprogram yourself. Reprogram yourself. The Bible says about that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to reprogram yourself. Come on, let's stand together and pray. God, this is awesome. If you accepted Jesus, I'd love to meet you after the service, get you connected to one of our starting group classes. How about we rejoice together before we leave today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You're awesome, Jesus. You're good. Your mercy endures forever, oh God. And we have this great privilege of telling everybody that we can that Jesus Christ can change.